I believe that storytelling has the power to transform our lives in the most fascinating and unexpected ways. Over my career as a journalist and social entrepreneur, I met individuals whose passion and values are making this world a better place. I am Elizabeth Filippouli, and I invite you to hear the stories of some amazing, inspirational people. Shainor, I would be uh, keen to go back to your childhood and ask you about the young Shainor. Where was she born? What was the country that she was growing up in? And how did this country and her immediate family influenced the first years of Shainor? Elizabeth, that's a, a wonderful question and it brings back memories, uh, good and bad. So I was born in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and I was born into a relatively wealthy family. My father owned the Total Petrol Agency in Tanzania and so that was uh, petrochemicals, which meant that, you know, we had a good life. I had a nanny, my mother was at home, etc. And then during that time, uh, the Tanzanian government made it compulsory that you learnt in Swahili, and which was the national language, and my parents wanted me to learn English. So they sent me to a boarding school in Kenya called Loreto Convent. They're very famous, they're run by nuns. And so that's where at the age of three and a half, I went to a boarding school and I missed my parents incredibly. But what it instilled in me was the real importance of education, uh, which was a critical pillar for my family. So I think that was a real starting spot for me. Uh, very soon after that, unfortunately, all the businesses became nationalized and we became refugees. And so we moved to the UK. And when I moved to the UK, I was six years old. Um, and we literally went from, you know, having a very comfortable life to three brothers and my grandfather, their wives and children landing in the UK uh, with 5,000 pounds, which sounds like a lot of money, but really wasn't. And so the only thing we could do was actually buy a grocery store, which had a three bedroom apartment above it. And each family had one room and my grandfather was in the living room. I was the eldest child. So those steps, that sort of insecurity, that displacement, I think you will find as I speak about my story more, have been critical foundational pillars and experiences that have led me the path that I have taken. In this, what sounds like not an easy childhood, I would assume that a child that is, you know, taken to a boarding school and of course misses their family, uh, they are faced with all sorts of uh, challenges, uh, psychological challenges, but also, you know, it's the physical as well, because the two are intertwined. Yes. Um, was there a person that was like a pillar for you? So I think that there are two categories there. I think that the most incredible force that has helped me through every stage of my life has been my faith. And I am a follower of His Highness the Aga Khan, so I'm an Ismaili Muslim. And uh, there are many of our teachings that people are not fully aware of. For example, we are taught that if you have a boy and a girl, you should educate your daughter because she will be the mother of future generations. And so that has afforded me access to education, which I talked about earlier. I think also the ability to give back and to think of those less fortunate. And then just the sort of guidances uh, that come out of the practice of our faith. So I think that has played a very fundamental role in, in my life. And then I would say that for every daughter, the father, my father has been a, a pillar of strength because in him, I have seen resilience, I have seen vision, I've seen tenacity, you know, I've seen the ability to hustle. 
you know, to not give up uh, when the chips are down. And so I have lived that with him being the eldest child. And therefore I think those things have rubbed off on me and I've seen the value of being able to practice and enable those things in my own life. Was there a particular talent that you had, perhaps you yourself had not realized that someone else had spotted it and uh, they were encouraging towards it, or perhaps you knew that you had it, but you didn't know quite what to do with it? So I think that's an interesting question because, you know, in my life, there have been various people that I have met that have sort of been awed by the abilities that I distributed, you know, the attributes I had, and they may have been sort of, uh, you know, women that were um, people that I would go to for advice. Um, they may have been doctors, uh, people within the community, outside the community, at school. But I think that the one uh, skill set that I am now acknowledging that I have always had, and I've always joked about it, saying that I dream in Technicolor. So I have always been fascinated by the big issues um, in life, and I've always seen problems from multidimensional lenses. And I think I've had the fortunate experiences of being able to put myself in the other's shoes. And I think that has been critical in my ability to be able to galvanize people around me to solve some of these big problems. So things like, you know, when I went to Afghanistan and uh, we were trying to think about how a telecoms company could create impact I remember coming up against all kinds of barriers because I wanted to do healthcare, I wanted to do education, social and welfare, commerce, you know, culture. And, you know, the board would say to me, well, can't we just sort of do one thing? Let's get behind one thing. And I think looking at problems via an ecosystem lens, you know, if you gave somebody great education, great. If they couldn't get money or couldn't get a job, they're back to square one, right? This was a, a multi-dimensional, multi-input problem if you were going to solve it. And I remember working at Roshan Community so hard, so hard, you know, every day um, to, to actually build it. And it wasn't until we had actually built it and won a coveted award internationally from the committee encouraging corporate philanthropy uh, that people actually began to understand and follow uh, what we had actually built. We'll get to the projects and we'll get to that but before that I would like us to talk a bit about your, your studies. So you are you know in your teens um, talk, uh, talk to us about, you know, how long you stayed at the boarding school and then what was the course uh, from your teens onwards during your, your years of studies? So, you know, I abruptly left boarding school. My father just showed up one day and said, you know, pack your bags and we're leaving. We're going to London because that's, that, those were the circumstances on the ground. And then when I came to the United Kingdom, I went to a uh, comprehensive school in our local area. Uh, and it, uh, it was a school that had sort of 35, 36 kids in the class of various abilities. Um, and my sort of after school curricular activities were working in our grocery shop, labeling tins, et cetera and delivering groceries to, to people in the community. And then at the age of 11, I was very fortunate because a teacher at school had highlighted the fact that I could apply for a government scholarship. Um, and so I did that scholarship exam and got into one of the girls' public day school trust schools, Stretton Hill and Clapham High, uh, on Telford Avenue on a government scholarship. 
So my secondary education was a private education, which was obviously education with a capital E because, you know, there were smaller classes. I had more choices of subjects, etc., and therefore, um, you know, could excel in areas that I was good at. I also had the opportunity to represent the school in the tennis, um, you know, sort of teams, the hockey and the netball, and actually qualified for the England under 18 qualifiers. Um, and then was later on in life as a physiotherapist to the England ladies hockey team. Um, but that was very transformative for me. And that's why investing and um, raising funds for education has been a key pillar of my life, uh, as you see it sort of unravel. Um, on graduation, I actually went to do physical therapy. I trained at St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and it was bringing together kind of the science and the sport love that I had. And it was actually quite coincidental in that in the summer between my O and A levels, I was doing voluntary work at St. Thomas's Hospital and they would put me two weeks on every specialty. And on this particular week, I was working on the geriatric ward and a patient was discharged and they forgot their walking frame but it was on my bus route back home. So I said, okay, I'll drop it off. And therefore had to go to the physiotherapy department and wait. And while I was waiting there, I saw the knee class going on and the sort of neurotherapy going on and the orthopedic manipulations going on and thought, wow, I need to figure out how I do this. And that's how I ended up in physical therapy. Well, you talked about the hockey team. So before getting to physiotherapy, I'm wondering whether that part of your life kind of nurtured within you the idea of winning uh, competition, uh, teamwork at the same time, collaboration, solidarity with your teammates. What was it that you learned by you know, becoming um, a sports person? So I think that the sports element was critical because one, it was competitive to get in um, at that level. But second, it taught you persistence, perseverance, training, you know, repetitive, repetitive, repetitive till you mastered something. And so it really gave you that skill of being able to be focused on something and mastering it. I think then as a team, you know, we were, we were close to being very good, but we weren't the best. Uh, you know, there were other GPDST schools and other schools that had more facilities, etc. I remember we had to walk a 20 minute walk to our sports field, etc, uh, which others just had on hand. But you know, that also sort of made it sweeter when you won because of the hard work that you had put in. Uh, so I think that, you know, that kind of camaraderie and also the coming together of different cultures. Um, if you know the UK well, and you know London well, that Streatham Hill and Clapham High area borders on Brixton, it borders on Norwood, you know, there are different demographics that came together in this school. And I think that was a really um, interesting and foundational stone for me again, because it helped me see everyone as equal rather than one being better than the other, especially taking into account my own background and where I came from and how privileged I was to have access to those um, educational facilities. And then I think you remind me of a, a very important piece that I forgot to speak about earlier, but I was extremely close to my middle uncle. Um, and uh, at the age of 39, he got up one day and just collapsed. And uh, when he was examined, they figured out that he had a prolapsed disc in his lumbar spine, which perhaps paralyzed him. 
And so they took him in for surgery, brought him out within a very short period of time and told us that it actually was not a disc, but it was a tumor and that my uncle had very little time uh, to live. And for that period of time, I actually sort of ran his shop because we now had two shops. So I took some time out of school and I was running the shop. I was very close to him. I went on his honeymoon with him and my aunt. He taught me to swim. He taught me to ride a bike. You know, it was a very close relationship. And the, the few times that I could get out of the shop to go and visit him, I saw the physios working with him. And I think that was probably the seed that was sown for me, um, for him, uh, that I really wanted to be able to give back in a way that would help people get more independent and you know, be able to function properly in life. And I think that was the sort of seed that was sowed at that time, but I didn't look upon it until much later on. That, you know, inevitably well, makes me want to ask, did your, did your uncle survive or did you lose him early? Uh, unfortunately, we lost him early. Um, his wife was 29 and uh, two cousins younger to me. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they've grown up like sisters with me. My aunt lived with us. Uh, we're a very tight family. Uh, it was only when they got a lot older and got married, they moved out and my aunt moved in with a friend. Um, but, you know, as most Asian families are, we are still very, very close uh, together. But I think, you know, what that period of time kind of makes me reflect on is that I don't think I've ever let my hair down. Um, it, you know, it has been a very rich uh, life, uh, but I, I didn't have the luxury of a carefree um, rise to adulthood. And so to some extent, I think I have always um, carried that responsibility which in one way is great because it's great fuel to keep you going and going. Uh, but I would reflect on it in another way as well and say, you do have to manage it because otherwise it can be all consuming and that in itself is not always good. And I'm just realizing that as I get older because for the time that I was out in the emerging markets full time. My children were very young. You know, when I went out, they were six and eight. And, uh, you know, I spent 15 years out there. So they literally brought themselves up. We're very, very close. And they've done extremely well and made me very proud. But I feel like in a, a lifetime, in a click, all those years were uh, missed out on. Uh, and my children, uh, they wrote very wonderful um, common application essays that made me cry. But they talked about the kids that needed us more than they needed us. Uh, and so I'm very proud to have instilled those qualities in, in my children. I wonder uh, if losing someone who's important and of course, I know that it's a very subjective question and it, of course, relates and touches on different parts in everyone's life. But could it become a motivation rather than a setback? How did you experience it? Did it push you backwards or sometimes, and I'm speaking about myself, Losing someone you love, you admire, means, you know, the world to you for whatever reasons. You want to do good things with your life so that you honor their memory, their presence, their contribution to your life. So I think that both with the loss of my uncle and then 10 years ago, sadly, the early loss of my father, they were two very heavy blows on me and for a while it was hard because 
they were my rocks, you know, they were my, I've lived by that um, mantra that make failure matter, you know, so if you're going to try something, 50% chances you're going to fail. But when you fail, obviously, if you're a winner, you hate failing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, these two pillars um, and my husband, I think, the, the three men there have really been the solid foundation on which I could fail and pick myself up and go forward. But I think after those two losses, it was very much a question of what they had taught me in their life. You know, they had lost and won and lost and won many times over. And what they had taught me was to get up and do the best. So, you know, there were certain things that were pillars in my life as I grew up. You never lie. However bad it is, tell it. If we know the truth, we can help you with it, right? You, you don't give up. You don't fail, right? You get up and you get going. Third, you ask for help if you need it. There's always somebody around that has the skills or the compassion, or the empathy, or the guidance to guide you the right way. And I think those three things have been three things that I have held close to, to me, and I have led by that, you know. So I have been propelled to do more, you know, to, to make them proud and to make myself proud of their memory and their contributions, because during their lives, despite you know, the level at which we were operating financially, they themselves had always contributed and given to make the world a better place. And so that was something that I felt had always got to be part of my life. So let us move on to your career now. Uh, what was it? I mean, I would like to hear about the dreams, the aspirations, uh, the enthusiasm, and of course the fears, insecurities, because it is the, the unknown. There is the driving force there. There is, you know, the, the passion, of course, which ideally someone who starts with their career uh, should feel, can feel, although it's not always the case. Uh -huh. um, because sometimes, as I know, as we know, our first job or our first venture is not necessarily the ones, the one that we uh, will love the most, or will be the best for us, or the one that will be the most successful. But as you just mentioned, it is very much a trial and error. It is very much about failing and learning from that failure. Although I do not have that word in my dictionary, so I'm in full, you know, alignment with you. But uh, take us to the, the dreams and aspirations and uh, how the career started, how your, your first venture went, and then uh, we will go to how it this evolved, evolved, evolved sorry, uh, progressed into what became, you know, serial entrepreneurship. Excellent. So having graduated from St. Thomas's Hospital, um, you know, the, the, the aspiration was to get a job and to rise within the hospital system um, to end up heading up a department. But I, I loved the patients and I loved the kind of connection, etc. So that was where I started. I did start within the NHS. And at that time, the NHS was not at its best. So very often I would get a patient too late too late to be able to actually help them without them having surgery. And literally within six or eight weeks, I acknowledged that this is not the way I wanted to operate. That was not the kind of practice I wanted to be. I didn't just want to sort of uh, do the minimum and pass people on to surgery and do the post-surgery sort of rehab. So at the age of 21, um, I convinced my father, and I, I married young as well, so I was married at 20, and I convinced my husband that if we bought a property and I converted it into a clinic, if it didn't work at the end of the day, we could sell it for a profit and we'd be square and even. 
And so that's how I, I got them to help me buy a property in Ealing and I converted it into a clinic. I bought the best equipment out and I still remember the salesperson because uh, by this time our family had progressed and we were in the hotel business and so forth. So the salesman came to my father's hotel as we sort of uh, put the kit together for what I was going to buy. And I remember smiling at him. I still remember his name. And I said, hey, Keith, you're just smiling, aren't you? Because you think you're going to sell this to me and you're going to come back in six months and buy a pennies in the pound from a, a rich daddy. And he smiled. And we're still friends today because that never happened, of course. So it was a nerve wracking time to, to start a clinic at that time because I may have been a physio, I wasn't a very experienced physio. And two, yes, I had always worked in business, but I didn't actually have the academic framework of business. But you know, I knew how many patients I needed, I knew how much I needed to charge and I knew how much I needed to pay. Uh, in bills. So that's how I started. And I remember that I was all set to start in May of 1987 and BT was on a strike. So I couldn't get a telephone line. And you know, the, the hot headed person I was, I found the phone number of the chairman of BT. And I phoned and I said, hey, I'm a young person in business and I'm going to go out of business by the time you can give me a telephone line. The next morning, a BT engineer was there. He hooked up my line. The only problem was it was the old line of Cato's, the um, hardware store. So the phone rang all day, but it wasn't for a patient. And it drove me insane. But fortunately, third day in, I got a patient. And from then on, it was just history, right? It was very counterintuitive. Um, but I needed to get people better quickly and out the door because the more they got out the door and spoke to other people, the more the referrals came up. It was also extremely hard to ask for money because I had not gone into this profession to ask for money. And I still remember my, some of my early patients as a builder, because I used to get a lot of builders, carpenters, bankers, these kinds of um, tr trades and people that couldn't sort of wait six weeks. And I remember Tom, you know, we'd chit chat after the treatment and then he'd turn around and he'd say, well, are you going to ask me to pay or not? Because I could never bring myself um, to ask for, for the money. But anyway, the clinics grew, the clinic grew and then I, you know, built another clinic and they all flourished. And of course I went out and I spoke to doctors. I did career fairs and I went to sports clubs and helped there, etc. help with training and uh, sort of stretching and sort of providing physio services at games and tournaments. I did home visits for the elderly and care homes. And so the whole thing kind of cascaded over. And um, four or five years in, I decided that I needed to go back and give back. And so I went back to Pakistan, kept the clinics going. I went for the summer, a three month trip and uh, taught physical therapy. And that was my first realization that actually I could professionally and academically give back to the emerging markets, to the developing world. And so that, that was a clear kind of bell ringing in my head that I always did want to give back. And now I can actually give back with my own experience and academic excellence. So that became an annual thing. Um, that I would go to. And during this period of time, what happened was that the UK healthcare system changed in that, you know, basically they went through something called GP fund holding. So what it was when I started was that you could go to your GP and you'd be referred to a hospital physiotherapist and it was free. And there was a long waiting list. So those people would come to a private practitioner like myself. Now with GP fund holding, every physiotherapist 
and every GP practice became their own little business and they got their money so they could contract with whoever. And I looked at this and I thought, oh gosh, I could lose all my private work because everything becomes more efficient. So I bid for 12 contracts and I won all 12 of them. And now I was in a state because I was actually no longer a physiotherapist, but I was a businesswoman in the business of physical therapy. And that was a, a very different proposition. So I very quickly applied to City University to do a health MBA because I felt I needed that academic structure. And obviously there were many people, family and uh, mentors that I relied on to help me think through all the processes. Um, and I went and I did a part-time MBA one day a week and one week a month. And I had other physios work for me during that time. I also had my two children. Uh, so it was an extremely busy time. And that's when all my resilience, my hard work, my perseverance all came together. Um, the interesting thing was post the MBA, I actually realized that I was good at a lot of other things that I had never considered because I'd been so focused on the sciences and the sport and then the physiotherapy and so forth. And so that broadened my horizon a little more. And so then soon after, you know, I sort of began to manage the clinics, but also get into things like pharmaceuticals and uh, hospitality. And so I was much more in the business realm uh, than anything else. Um, and then I guess soon after that, my husband, who's a telecom specialist, um, got a job offer to go to Pakistan to set up a telephone company there. And of course, because of my connections going back and forth teaching, uh, it was a yes. And so I sold, initially I kept the clinics running and I would fly back and forth. Um, and whilst I was in, um, Pakistan, I set up a clinic there, but I also worked with Afghan refugee children in the camps. Uh, and that's when the sort of seed was sowed um, on Afghanistan, but eventually sold those clinics um, and uh, continued the, the voluntary work and the grassroots work that I was doing. Uh, and then from there went to Poland, did a clinic there uh, and also worked with Polish charities uh, there, as well as doing an import-export business in pharmaceuticals, over-the-counter products, etc. cetera. Um, then moved back to Canada and then uh, decided that uh, to really make impact, I needed to get in at a po policy level. And so I did my LSAT and applied to law school. <laughs> I uh, got into UBC and uh, did my first year of um, law school. And uh, I actually remember juggling that time was very hard because um, we went to Canada, I got into law school and my husband was supposed to look after the family and the kids so that I could do full-time law. And during that time, His Highness the Aga Khan asked him to go to Afghanistan and so he left for Afghanistan and I was left with a full-time practice, full-time law, two kids and my in-laws. And I remember I used to drive, drop the kids off, go to university, pick the kids up, come home and then do an evening clinic and then work late at night reading cases, etc. And on one occasion, I stopped to pick up my son. I heard the door shut the car door and I drove off. I was chatting to him. I got to the traffic lights and realized that he had put his bag in, but had not himself got in. So, you know, the nightmare of a irresponsible mother, I felt terrible. But anyway, at the end of um, that first year of law, uh, I came to Dubai and uh, then went on to Afghanistan to help. 
because they needed a clinic because there was nowhere to treat people in those early days. And so they couldn't attract any expats. So I built the clinic over the summer and then uh, we had recruited somebody to come in and run it, but they at the last minute declined and therefore, um, you know, I decided to take a year's sabbatical from UBC and then the rest is history when it came up to that year coming to an end, telemedicine was at its peak and so I never went back to finish that. Um, but lifelong education has been part of my life. Um, and so I went on and did other things. But I'll stop there because I'm rambling on. <laughs> You're not rambling on at all. I mean, you have a fascinating story, which uh, makes me, you know, wonder whether you are a Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have, you know, many questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to take a little step back because you condensed uh, an incredible story, an incredible success story uh, within, you know, just a few minutes. And, and my question as perhaps an aspiring entrepreneur, someone who would dream to emulate somehow uh, what you have done or partly uh, what you have accomplished would be who supported you in this journey so so you are a young entrepreneur you're setting up your first business you have your first patient and then over a course of you know a few years you manage to build a chain of of practices and at the same time, a multitude of different businesses, but also juggling family and, and kids, and we, we'll get there. But uh, the immediate support, and by saying immediate, it could be over a period of three, four, five years as, as the business was growing, so you needed more support. In the beginning, I assume, and again, judging from myself as a CEO, I was always myself, uh, myself's PA or I was or at the same time the CFO or at the same time the CTO. So I, I myself had to you know, wear many hats and I assume in the beginning it was the same for you. But as you grow and as you succeed, you build a team. How difficult, how easy was to find the right people for those roles? And what was it to build you know, that team of human talent? Excellent question. So I think that I have to say that my mother, my mother-in-law, they've always worked um, and supported their husbands and the families. And so I would never have been able to achieve what I did without the help of my mother and my mother-in-law, because they helped with a lot of the, the kids' issues. Then, you know, I think it was also very helpful for me that I had a husband that was working. So we weren't dependent on my income in the early days when I started. I was also very fortunate with the patients that I had. You know, I don't know if it was fate or what, but um, you know, as I mentioned, I, I had bankers. So I used to treat Gaelic footballers, which is an Irish sport like rugby. And um, basically they were all bankers or construction workers. And so, you know, Allied Irish Bank and all of these people, they, they would support me with loans when I needed the loans to, to do whatever I needed to do in terms of expansion. So that was really helpful. Very early on, one of my clients was a um, recruiter at one of the very large firms, and he was very, very um, accomplished gentleman in business and finance and connections, and he became my mentor. So he was extremely helpful in helping me think through the next steps when to take the next step so that you don't burn and bust, right? How to consolidate things, how to structure your growth. So all of those things, and I was fortunate enough to get those things as 
help and advice rather than having to always pay for, for that, which was very, very helpful to me. And then I think, you know, in terms of finding the right people, for me, it's always been about the people. And I've had my fair share of wrong moves as well as right moves. Uh, and I think this is just something that I've had to learn over time. So obviously when you're trying to build a team, you, you look at your own skills and then you look at where there are gaps. Gaps in what the business needs and gaps in what you need to, to make you stronger. And you know, in my early days, I would readily say that I made mistakes because I actually took on good people, but I wasn't ready to let go. Uh, to me, letting go was a sign of weakness when it shouldn't have been. But I had to learn that because I went into business very early on. And I was very much hands-on treating, hands-on billing, hands-on sort of, you know, watching what um, the receptionists, et cetera, were doing and saying. I mean, just the design, if I explain the design of my clinic, it will give you a lens into what was really quite spectacular in one way, but in another reflective way was very control freak. So, you know, I had consultation rooms with doors and then they had a circular curtain. So I could leave the door ajar and the patient was still private, but I could hear what was going on in the waiting room or on the phone. Now, in one way, that is very creative because you're hands-on, you're in touch, you can support everyone. But in another way, it's very claustrophobic for somebody that's working for you. And so I had to muddle my way through that. But over the years, I was fortunate enough to have you know, two wonderful ladies who after a bunch of younger people at the front desk, I went with retirees that split the week between them. Reliable, experienced, mature, you know, uh, always showed up, terrific for me and could help me in many more ways than just the job description that they were responsible for. And I was very fortunate to have two or three very good physical therapists that stayed with me for many years on a profit share. And so I think, you know, what this period of time taught me was, you know, the importance of bringing people on, but not necessarily having them salaried. You know, it can be performance related but fair, because then they have skin in the game. And the value of that uh, became very evident in, in what happened with the businesses and how long they stayed with me, uh, which was terrific. Did you have to, to handle any crisis or was everything uh, smooth and plain sailing? And uh, is there any particular crisis or two that you could share with us and also how you managed uh, to overcome it. What was the, the feelings, you know, when you first were confronted with, you know, something that you either weren't expecting or the magnitude of it was too big or, you know, something that uh, scared you, that made you uh, feel that, oh, um, how am I going to handle this? How am I, how am I going to, you know, get a solution for this? And the lessons, how you handled it, the process and the lessons that you've learned. So, you know, during this kind of decade uh, and a bit, I would say there were several crises, but um, most memorable was this was a period where I think it was 1989-ish um, that we went through very high interest rates. And I believe that they were about 18% uh, at that time. And I just remember one day coming home, I used to work very long hours. I'd work, I'd go from 7.30 in the morning with my first patient 
to 7.30 at night with my last patient. I literally had patients every 15 minutes, but I revolved around a set of cubicles. And then I finished at 6 p.m. on a Friday, and I worked Saturday morning from 8 till 1 p.m. So it was a pretty heavy week. And uh, I remember coming home and saying to my husband, I don't think I can do this because literally everything I was earning between paying what I owed, the bills and the nanny that I needed to have in order to work, you know, I wasn't making anything and it just didn't make sense. And I remember going through a few weeks of desperation because it's not so easy. You can't just go in and quit <laughs> because, you know, you're responsible for other people's salaries. You're responsible for all the debt that you have, et cetera. And I, that was a pretty difficult time for me because I think I'd been on this kind of roller coaster upwards um, that, that hadn't leveled off. And then now there was a, a big dip coming. And, you know, it was just with guidance from the bank, guidance from mentors that I managed to kind of cut costs. If you can believe it, I worked harder than I would have um, and sort of managed my way through that period of time and came out on top, which was good. I think that the second sort of interesting piece for me was around the fact that when I first started my clinic, you know, I picked this area because I'd done some market research and it was, you know, where surrounding this area were the big multinational companies, lots of employees, sports clubs, um, private hospitals, large GP practices. It made sense in every way. But it was also the area in which the head of the physiotherapy private practitioners had her practice. And she'd been there for 16 years prior to me coming. And she had all the relationships. So it was an uphill struggle to get going. Um, but then when I got so successful, she closed down for a bit and then she reopened with a all singing, all dancing, exceptional clinic. And so the competition really built up. And uh, that again was a moment to kind of sit back and reflect and think about my offering because my offering hadn't really changed from the day I started. I hadn't evolved that offering. I had evolved my customer base, but I hadn't really evolved the different ways in which I could enhance what I was giving. And so it really pushed me, um, you know, hard to think about the ways in which I could improve my service. And that's when things like fitness testing, visiting multinational corporations and giving talks, uh, being able to go and do sort of assessments of sitting postures, et cetera. I just expanded um, the product suite that I was giving um, to, to my clients a little bit further. And that helped me sort of differentiate myself better from the competition. So it was good in a way to have that competition, but it was very scary because it was threatening everything I had built, right? And, and people basically want to go to the nicest, most professional place that they can. Um, so, you know, I think those two were really important pieces. On a personal level, during this time, I also lost a baby boy. Um, which was very, very hard for me. And, um, you know, which sort of took me away from the practice for a short period of time whilst I recovered. Uh, but the hard thing of it all was that 
because I saw repeat patients and I saw them for a short while and then they'd get better and then hurt themselves and come back. Um, it took me a lot longer to get over this because people would come in all happy and say, oh, what did you have? You know, and they meant well, but for me, I just had to relive that event repeatedly. Uh, but again, you know, that helped me help others who've had to go through similar issues and they would seek me out and I could relate to what they're going through. You know, it will be 31 years today, you know, to this year that I, I lost the baby boy. And um, it's very hard for people that haven't been through the experience. They can be empathetic, but they can't really understand what it's like to hold a child in your arms that doesn't breathe. So that, again, was a monumental lesson for me. And I think it's, it's some of these things that keep my feet to the ground, <laughs> you know, because sometimes success can be, you know, mesmerizing, you know, you can get prizes and awards and it can become all consuming. And then you forget about, you know, the real nature of life and, and the force that nature and fate has on you. You know, there are just so many things that you can control and there are others that you've just got to be grateful for. So I'm very grateful I have two lovely children, boy and a girl, <laughs> who've done very well. I'm sure that the both of them uh, look up to you as a role model, but uh, how was it as you were, you know, bringing them up because clearly you have been doting mother, but also a very passionate businesswoman and someone who was dedicating a lot of their time and energy, as you yeah. mentioned, in building uh, the business, in supporting others. So you yourself were wearing many, many hats. And when children are at a young age, they cannot appreciate you know, that their mother is, is uh, so such a prolific personality, such a full of energy creature and, and such a talented individual that inevitably she has to juggle many things. And sometimes, you know, we may dispute the love or, you know, the dedication that our mother has for us, which of course is a, um, a, a false perception, but uh, children, our children, and I wonder how the relationship with them was for a woman who was such a successful entrepreneur. So you, you touch on something that's very close to my heart, and uh, I speak to many women about this because I went through Korea at a time where many of my friends were at home when they had their kids. And it wasn't that when I had the children, I didn't have the option to be at home. I could have been at home, but I chose the option to work because having taken a week off and gone to enough coffee mornings, I realized that I was not going to be the best mother in that role if I was being denied what my passion was. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it was right for me. And fortunately, everyone around me that mattered agreed with that. I was also really fortunate because I was in a business where I could have my children with me all the time. So, you know, I breastfed for nine months. So those 15 minute sessions, every seven session, I didn't have a session so that I could breastfeed but not everybody has the luxury of that. Because I had lost the baby boy and I lost him first before I had the other two, the children were absolutely epicenter to me. You know, so within the context of my work, they were very integral to what I did. The real issue was when I went to Afghanistan and they were so young. They were too young to really understand the magnitude of the work that we were doing. And they really did need us. 
and they needed us at a time when we didn't have um, Zoom as stable as it has today. There was Skype, but you know, it was just coming out. Computers didn't have cameras and you had to buy lock-on cameras. The only good fortune was that it was for a telephone company that I was out there that I could actually speak to them. So it was very difficult. I did have moments when my husband was in Afghanistan and I was mother and father to the kids. I had moments where I would go to the hockey practices at 5 a.m. But for my son, he needed his father, not his mother. He appreciated his mother, but he needed his father. I remember dance recitals where I went, but my daughter was forever looking for her father. So, you know, those were really difficult times to juggle. They were also times when, you know, because my husband and I were in Afghanistan together, I used to fly back on a Thursday night at 9 p.m., spend Friday and Saturday with the kids and leave at 4 a.m. Sunday morning to fly back to Kabul. And every time I left, there were tears. And every time I left, there was, do you have to go? Can't, can't you stay an extra day? And the pull on my own heart was horrible. I, I wouldn't wish anyone to have to live through that but I just couldn't take my kids with me. And the work to me was just too important to, to not do. Um, and I think that will stay with me all my life because I do regret missing that time with the children. It goes without saying. But my saving grace is that as they've grown up, they both came out to Afghanistan to do voluntary work and they've both explored the work that my husband and I have done, and they've both understood it, which has been a tremendous relief. But for those eight, 10 years, when you know <clears throat> they didn't quite understand and you tried to explain, it was hard. There's no denying it, it was hard. And I think it's a burden that men and women carry, but women, you know, carry a larger burden of that and are judged for it, which is extremely sad. Uh, I really do think that, I think pre-COVID, we were moving towards uh, a greater work-life balance and a greater integration of women and their needs and this whole idea of presenteeism, of having women sort of stay at the office longer than they needed to be, was being washed away. And firms were coming up, they were realizing the importance of having women in the mix, the importance of the skills they brought, their uh, compassion, their empathy to, the, to businesses. But unfortunately, I think with COVID, what has happened is that women have been unfairly targeted, furloughed and let go, that I am quite worried now that uh, the trend is going to be far more negative than it was before. But I digress. I think that this work-life balance for women is always going to be a major issue. And I will just add one more point here, which I took into consideration when I had my kids. Now, I had my daughter in my first month of uh, MBA class at City University. And the lecturer's name was Patricia something, it'll come to me. And she was the HR lecturer. And her assignment was due the day that Nerissa was due to be born. So I went up to her after class and I said, you know, my baby, I'm ex expecting my baby um, on the 20th. So in case I'm a bit late, is it okay? And she turned Pat Oakley, Pat Oakley was her name. Uh, she turned around to me and she said, if you were a CEO of a multinational company, do you think 
that the company would care about that. If something is due, it should be due. And that was really good because, you know, in, in many ways, I delivered the assignment. It was faxed from the hospital and it was fine. But she later clarified that, you know, in her time, she always put it off. She always said, I'll do this for my career and then. I'll have the kids, you know, I'll do this and then I'll have the kids. And then you get to a point where it's too late. And she said, never trade off life for work. You know, and that was the big lesson from her. Don't trade off life for work. Life happens, work happens. The two have to be integrated. So that was a great lesson from her. This is an exceptional story that you just shared. Um, and the whole journey, of course, is exceptional and fascinating, uh, Shainur. Uh, I would like us to go to Afghanistan now and hear about the projects there. And uh, I know that I've asked you to pick some photos really to recollect about moments because sometimes we look back into our lives or the way that we remember our lives is like, you know, this very interesting journey, but we tend to not remember or recollect some moments which have been very important, which have been defining moments or projects or people exactly. And that was the reason why I suggested, please pick two or three photos that mean something to you because it will take us back to something that shaped your project, so what you are today. So whether this is Afghanistan or Poland or both, or you know Pakistan as well, let us now go into these, these important uh, moments for you. Okay, so it was very hard, but I don't know if you can see this, I'll send the picture properly, but this was me going out to um, Afghanistan to Pakistan to teach physical therapy. And I think that was a defining moment for me because there I was able to give back more than money, right? More than money. I live by this Khalil Gibran um, saying that says, you give little, but when you give of your possessions, you only truly give when you give of yourself. And so that was that picture denotes, that period denotes the time where I actually realized that I could give back in a different way from what I know and learn. And there were some interesting moments at that time because, you know, there were 13 physical therapists there that I trained and I trained them in manipulative therapy um, and electrotherapy and neurotherapy, cardiovascular stuff things that they wouldn't have access to without a lot of money and the ability to go to the UK. And I remember at the end of it, 11 of the physios applied for their American boards and passed. And it just so happened that at the same time, His Highness the Aga Khan, who's the chairman of the Aga Khan University was visiting the Aga Khan University hospital in Karachi. And I didn't have an audience with him, but the CEO, the president did. And when I was treating the president on a separate occasion, I said to him, you know, we really should have made sure that these physios signed agreements to say that they would stay for two or three years after being given the, the, the training, because now we're going to lose all these people, which is such a shame. Now he mentioned this to his highness in a meeting, and this is the lesson that came back to me. So his highness said, we don't want to tie anyone to the institution that doesn't want to be here. We should be supportive of people that want to go forth and learn and contribute to the world. But remember, when they go forth, they will learn, they will gain expertise, and in the end, they are Pakistanis. They will come back and they will give to the institution. And whilst they're gone, they'll take our values and share them abroad. Now that is such a long 
long distant thinking um, thought. But today, you know, one of the physios I trained is heading up the uh, pediatric department. Another physio is running the physio department. So spot on, he was right. So that is a very memorable point in my time. I think that the other pictures I put together, I would put them like so. Um, because what you see here is uh, the refugee Afghans that are dressed in uniform for Roshan. And you see how they have come forward, been trained, are now supporting their families with earnings, etc. The various projects, the education projects, the commerce projects that are going on, which are incredible. And the other half of this picture is His Highness the Aga Khan at the Enabling Environment Conference in Kabul. Now, this conference was important for two reasons. One was that because I had set up the telemedicine project in Afghanistan, it was possible to do a teleconference with the Prime Minister of Singapore and His Highness live for this conference. So that was utilization of the same technology. But what was really personal to me was what His Highness spoke about in his speech. And you can download the speech from the website um, where he actually talks about every project that I had launched and the impact of it and how important that was in the reconstruction process. So I've talked about my faith right through my life as a pillar. And for me, this was a very emotional time because it was an acknowledgement of my technicolor thinking uh, actually coming to fruition. And then the last picture I have is the picture of the kids in Syria. So in 2014, um, I went into Syria on a Canadian grant, a $12.75 million Canadian grant. And I was based in a place called Salamia, which is about 50 kilometers from Raqqa. And in Salamia, there were displaced individuals from all the surrounding areas who could not leave Syria for one reason or another. Either they didn't have enough money, they weren't well qualified, or they had elder parents that they needed to support and look after, whatever it was. And that grant was really to help with water and sanitation, with health, with commerce, with education. And so there were several projects that I did there again. But this project is super important to me because it still continues today. And it was so that 750 children could go to school every day to early learning centers. And I employed 168 teachers and administrators to manage it, brought the community together, the tradesmen to re, uh, basically renovate all the torn down buildings and bullet written buildings, paint it, etc. had the grandmas and mothers sew uniforms, etc. for the kids. And you can't imagine, it's not just that no generation is lost for education, but it's the fact that these kids are happy, integrated. They're of all different ethnic backgrounds and they are working and playing together in a normal life which was so abnormal for them at that time, because here they had access to activities, to clean water, to food, to shelter. And where they were living in camps, unfortunately, kids were abused to some extent. They were uh, exposed to anger and frustration of their parents because the situation was so tough. And so that, that makes me proud and it makes me feel that I've come full circle and given back. You know, my conditions were never as bad as this, but it makes me happy to know that I've been able to give back and maybe 
one of the thousands of kids there will go on to do something that will be very inspiring for others. Uh, do you feel, and that leads us to the final part, uh, Shainor, that uh, you have found your life's self-purpose? And this is something that is not easy to do. Sometimes people do not understand what this notion of self-purpose is. Whether you had found it, if you're considering that you have, early on in life, or whether these different journeys that you have selected and, and you're traveling um, kind of influenced later on in life what Shainor and Shainor's mission and life would be about? It's an interesting question. I think that I knew very early on that I wanted to give back, but I didn't know what that meant. You know, so in the early days of the physio uh, clinics, it was partly donating money and partly donating time and knowledge, right? What I call time and knowledge. And then, you know, as I moved on to other phases of my life, I realized that there was much more. It went deeper, you know. So when I show you the pictures of uh, the young teenagers and young adults that are now dressed in uniforms, I saw my purpose change in making their lives better so that they could go on and make a difference, you know. And so I would talk about one person may be there, like uh, Shireen Rahmani is the incumbent CEO now of Roshan. She's an Afghan woman. When I met her, she wanted to be a doctor, but she was thrown out of uh, medical school because girls couldn't go to medical school. She started off in our call center, answering calls. She then ended up being the PA to the CEO then with coaching, she went into HR. She became director of HR. And now today, she's the deputy CEO. That's what I call purpose. That's bringing somebody along. And what her position has done for Afghan women, not just in the company, but in the country, it's helped them aspire to a different level. Then I think, you know, it's evolved even further when I went out to Syria. I think that was a really interesting moment for me because I actually, when I went out, I went out without the infrastructure of Afghanistan. Like when I went out to Afghanistan, there was a place that I could live. We had security guards. There was a place where I worked. Our cars were, you know, drivers were taught how to drive um, in two, two car convoys and to be able to sort of get out of danger and such like. When I went to Syria, I went without any of that. I went with one other expat and we were just living with the community. We would go nine hours without electricity, 11 days without water, right? Not access to proper food, right? There was the same staple diet I mean, people were very creative but it was hard and I remember before going you know I was counseled that it, it was dangerous that um, was I aware of it and I also had was asked to put my will in order which I did uh, but I also went and visited both my children that were at university and I wrote them letters letters to open if something did happen to me and that was a very difficult time for me. I remember my son saying to me, Mom, haven't you done enough? Why do you need to go, right? And it took him a whole month and a half before he would pick up the phone from me because he was so hurt, so worried. But what I learned in that time in Syria, like the majority of people didn't speak English and I didn't speak fluent Arabic. So it was isolation at its greatest, right? You, you didn't have means of contacting the outside world. You couldn't just leave Syria because you had to apply for all kinds of permits and go through several checkpoints to get out. 
So there were many obstacles for you to leave. So you were mentally and physically confined to a certain extent. But what I learned was the different ways in which you can communicate and express yourself, the different ways in which you can galvanize community and find joy, and the different ways in which people could celebrate, be happy and content with so little. It was a real eye-opener for me that, you know, so often we go through life saying, oh, I wish I had, or I wish if only, you know, um, there are all these things that we focus on that are uh, shortages in our life. Whereas, you know, the majority of the people that I touch there were just content that they were together, they were family, and whatever it was, if it was for Touche for the 12th day in a row, it didn't matter. It wasn't what they were eating, it was the fact that they were doing it together. And I think that's been a really valuable rest lesson for me. When you ask me if I found my purpose, I think I'm still finding it. Um, and I think that the present project that I'm embarking on, which is Thrive, which is basically um, taking care of seniors and their caregivers, and the issue of isolation, loneliness, and stress, and the negative impacts that has on health. I think that I'm aspiring that that will be the culmination of everything because it's bringing back my physical therapy, it's bringing back everything I've learned about technology and scaling, about quality, about access, about opportunity, um, and respect and dignity. And so I'm very determined to make this a success and to build the kind of company I can really be proud of and that the people that know me can truly understand why it's structured the way it is. It's still early days, <laughs> but um, we've got a beta in the market and we're raising money and uh, I'm optimistic that we'll get there. Uh, an amazing story and an amazing journey and so much to learn from. I mean, I feel that, you know, you, I traveled myself in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and, you know, uh, in the projects, through the projects that uh, you have uh, been putting together. Is there anything at all in this journey, multiple journeys, that you would have done differently? Looking back, is there anything that uh, with the wisdom that you have accumulated with, uh, you know, the maturity, prudence, but of course I can detect the same passion and the same inspiration and motivation. I don't see any of that, you know, waning at all on the contrary, but is there anything that you would have done differently? I don't think I would have done anything differently because I enjoyed the path. But I think one thing I would advise others, and I'm trying to learn myself, is I wouldn't beat myself up as much as I did. You know, uh, it was just that much harder because I would second guess myself at times and I'd be hard on myself. And in general, women are. Um, so my advice to others would be learn from me don't be so hard on yourself. Celebrate yourself more times than uh, you beat on yourself. Because I think I wasted a lot of energy on that. And that was negative energy that I did not need. Any final message that you would like to communicate, to share? I think that in a world where um, we hear so much bad news and SDGs only 10 years to go, etc. I think that there is a world of opportunity here. And I think that you should be, everyone that's listening, anyone that's listening, I think you should be bold, aim high. If you fall short, you'll probably hit higher than you were going to hit anyway. And ask for help. You know, there is a great movement of people that are moving in the right direction, that's responsible, that's equitable, that's diverse, that's impactful. 
find those communities and ensure that your values mesh with theirs. Don't compromise and don't settle for less because we need more of us to focus on these important matters because they do make the world a better place. What are your top three values, Shainor? My top three values? Well, I think equity, diversity and inclusion as one big thing, you know, seeing the other as one. I think transparency and openness. And then with that goes trust. And then I think it's the ability to be sustainable, impactful and profitable. So I don't see differences in business between making money and making impact. I see them as being part of it all. And I always in my talks and conversations with younger people say that business actually came about, if we go back in time, business came about to serve the community, to serve the customer. And we kind of lost touch with that along the way. And I think there is, there is a real push with this next generation, the millennials and the Gen Zs, to really get back to that place where there is more balance. And I think COVID has helped to some extent. It's not the nicest um, way to get there, but I think it has helped. And I think post COVID, we will see companies that did it really well. And we will see companies that did not do it very well. And I think there'll be great lessons to be learned from that.